prawns to eat and that's how good they are. Lay them in a pan and just pour hot water over them and let them sit for three minutes and they're good to go. The spot prawn, a sure sign of spring and all the flavors that it brings. We're down in Oak Bay today to talk to makers and producers about eating local. We kicked off with fresh halibut at the beginning of March. Everybody loves it here. Oak Bay loves halibut. It's a really long season too, so you don't have to panic about it. It uh, goes all the way from the middle of March to the middle of November. The next kickoff is not the same at all. It's the six week chaotic window for the spot prawn fishery. <laughs> you blink and they're gone, but they're so good. Everybody just bends over backwards to, to get as many fresh as they can during that window. So that's coming up really soon. And as soon as that window closes, the fresh salmon door is just about ready to, to open. And then it'll be the sockeye run. And everybody will get excited about that. The cedar planks will come out, the barbecues will all get cranked up. Tell us a little bit about the local producers that you work with. You use, I think, all local products to make a local product? Yeah, yeah. We use as much as we can. We have a, a fantastic pork producer in Mitchell, Tom Henry at Still Meadow Farm. We buy whole pigs from him every week. We're actually cutting them up as we speak. Uh, lambs come from Still Meadow Farm. Beef from uh, Comox at Tanadice Farm. And uh, Cowichan Bay at Cowichan Valley Farm. And, uh, and lots of poultry. You know, we just bring in as much as we can and bring it in whole when, when we can. We find that fresh produce is coming into the market daily. We're finding uh, prices have changed drastically on those. Uh, we have local suppliers. As a local maker, you uh, change your menu up quite regularly here, so what are you seeing now as the seasons are changing? Are people looking for different things? Yeah, way more barbecue stuff on both sides, uh, in both shops. Um, we start making uh, wieners and bratwurst and things to go on the grill. Um, and we'll ramp up to 200 plus pounds of hot dogs a week. Um, oh. Because it's natural, handmade wiener and, and parents love them, I love them. Um, and of course, lots of steaks, lots of burgers, more outdoor cooking and a lot more uh, picnic stuff. Tons of stuff for uh, boaters, campers. Uh, a lot of the stuff works really well, it doesn't need refrigeration, so we get a lot of campers coming in. As people's palate is changing this time of year, we're finding that people are looking more for the fresh salads, lighter soups. The winter time was uh, a time when we focused on comfort food, and now we're focusing on more patio food. Things to take home, things to enjoy, in uh, social gatherings, we were able to sit outside, enjoy those meals, and just a whole sense of spring with the optimistic hope of summer on the way. Is there a particular sort of flavor profile they're looking for now with anticipation of warmer weather? Good question. Um, I would say a little bit of spice. Good flavor and properly made and ethically sourced. We have in the past uh, worked with organic farmers um, on the island and made things up for them and for us, and it's worked really well. From a consumer point of view, you want to test that it's got a nice hard shell. Crabs are molters. Tell us a bit about what OceanWise is. It's not just about local, it's really more about what's sustainable. Staying away from species that are overfished or are, are not fished in, in a sustainable manner. And you know it is healthy and you know that it's, you know, it's not going to be a boom of us fishery that's gone tomorrow. It's all part of our economy, small businesses, small shops helping one another. There's a lot of pride, uh, a lot of love, um, and it tastes better. People here are, are well informed, well educated, they've done their homework about what's out there and uh, what they should be eating and what it's better to stay away from. So wherever you are, when you're looking for something tasty, think local, eat local. For Community Producers, I'm Heather Leary. <laughs> How cute is that? Today, I'm at the Moss Street Market here in Victoria to interview one of my favorite organic farmers and pick up the ingredients to make healthy pesto zucchini noodles. How 
is organic farming better for the environment? Number one is that we, we're looking, we're tending to the earth on a timeline, of course. It starts from the soil. Feed the soil, look after the soil with the microbes, and everything grows on from there. What is your favorite thing to farm, and why? Microgreens are the, my favorite. Why? Energy-wise, vibrancy, and the nutrient dense. That's the key. They're close to my heart, like basil. <laughs> I grow a lot of basil, of course. This is beautiful. We use fish, organic fish and kelp to, um, they need feeding as, as you cut. What produce is in season in the fall? Tomatoes are really coming good. So they've built up their sugar content and they're really at their sweet prime right now. Kales come back on, of course. Strawberries are starting to slide a bit. Arugula is doing really fine because they're a cool season. And I'm going to use some arugula to make pesto today, along with the basil. Now we're going to dig into the arugula. So peppery. I love the flavor of arugula in pesto or in salads. And this looks amazing. I've found some gorgeous zucchinis, and I can't wait to spiralize them. Now I'm making zucchini noodles with pumpkin seed pesto. This dish is satisfying, it's full of flavor, and healthy too. It's grain-free, gluten-free, and dairy-free. And you can add the protein of your choice to make it even more filling. I'm starting with two cups of packed, fresh basil, and you do want to pluck it off the stem. Oh, it smells amazing. I love fresh basil. This is going into the food processor, along with one cup of packed arugula, or you could do parsley. I have two thirds of a cup of raw pumpkin seeds. So everything's just going in the food processor. It's super easy. Half a cup of your choice of olive oil or avocado oil. I personally like to use a mix of both because I find pure extra virgin olive oil to be really strong in taste. Two to three tablespoons of lemon juice. Two tablespoons of nutritional yeast. Now I'm not using any cheese in this recipe, so the nutritional yeast gives it sort of a cheesy flavor one teaspoon of Himalayan salt, or you could do sea salt. I'm gonna pop the top on, and I'm gonna process it down until smooth. I've processed it for about 15 to 20 seconds. Now I'm gonna take a peek. Oh wow, look at that. Looking so good. You can leave this as chunky or as smooth as you want. Wow, it is so fresh and tasty. For my noodles, I have a few zucchini here. You can peel them if you want. That'll create a white looking noodle or you can leave the skin on. That adds more nutrition. So I'm simply going to cut the ends off. Cut it in half, and here is my special gadget for making the noodles. This is called a spiralizer, and you can buy one at many stores or online for about $25, so it's really inexpensive, and it's a great tool to have in your kitchen. I'm going to push the zucchini into the spoke here, flip it in, and then I'm going to simply spiralize it. Look at that. <laughs> There's always a little piece that's left over. You can chop that up and add it to the dish. Look, healthy, low carb, gluten free, and grain free noodles. Next, I'm going to dice up some of these gorgeous purple cherry tomatoes. You can use any kind of tomato of your choice here or even some roasted red peppers. 
these are really, really sweet cherry tomatoes. They're delicious. And I'm gonna add in the pesto. You can use as much as you like. Oh, yum. I'm gently gonna mix it all together. Looking good. I can't wait to dig in. A nice big bowl of pasta, guilt-free, the best kind. For more great recipes, visit me at www.sweetlyraw.com. And now, it's time to take a bite. What happens when you combine the flavors of couch and honey with the deliciousness of authentic wood oven fired pizza? Well, you get a sweet treat that's creating a big buzz all over Vancouver Island. <laughs> all right, let's check these guys out. Yeah, there we go. That's good, perfect. What a great opportunity to possibly pair an old taste of couchin with a new taste. Prima Strada, who helped bring traditional Italian Neapolitan pizza to the island, is teaming up with the Cowichan Beekeepers Club to create honey-inspired pizzas, gelato. And there's even a sweet new cocktail titled The Bee's Knees, which I just had to try. Oh, that's delicious. Hey, honey. You want to try some? <laughs> Never gets old. Never. <laughs> this campaign is not only a delicious way to raise money for the Couch and Beekeepers Club, but it's creating a buzz about the importance of bees to our ecosystem. This is something that's really important to our community, to our lives, to the world, right? But more especially to our community to say, this is something really important and we want you to know about it. And it's delicious. And so why not have a really great, delicious experience and then tie that information to it and maybe it stays in your head and in your mouth and in your heart just a little bit longer. Over the past few decades, beekeepers have been noticing their honeybee populations have been dying off at increasingly rapid rates. And many species of bees have been added to the endangered list in a variety of countries, including Canada. Which is why the Cowichan Beekeepers Club are trying innovative and creative ways to educate the public about bee health. Bees, as we know with the media, they're in trouble. And so what we really want to do as the Couch and Bee Club is spread word to not just our members, but to the public. And so we can do that through hosting different workshops and just educating people as to what honeybees are as a species and what different troubles that they're facing these days. And just through education, we can then focus on planting crops for them that are beneficial, that are actually nectar producing crops. Cowichan, who boasts the warmest year-round temperatures in the country, is truly an agricultural mecca, with the first cidery and the first tea farm in Canada, award-winning wineries, and over 400 beekeepers. It's no wonder this community is so passionate about protecting their pollinators. Honeybees in particular, they pollinate tons and tons of important crops. I mean, things like canola and clover. And out here, I mean, we're such a little bit more smaller scale agriculture, but blueberries, um, raspberries, cranberries, those kinds of things are all pollinated by honeybees. Prima Strada is offering weekly feature pizzas using couch and honey. And if you want to get the buzz on the local bee scene, well, you can ask the pizzeria team who've been busy bees themselves, learning from the experts. To actually have the opportunity to come out to the hives and visit them and learn more about honeybees and what it is that they do was a huge, oh, it was just really exciting. It was one of my best field trips ever, right? And, and then to be able to bring that back into the pizzeria and share that with our staff and share that with our guests is just, um, not only just really gratifying, but a just a tremendous opportunity. Prima Strada will be celebrating the sweet flavors of couch and honey throughout the month of October in all of their locations, including their new Cobble Hill Pizzeria. 
right now, just with the number of diseases and pests that we're looking at in our honeybees, if we don't actually create these important networks, we're not going to have bees probably within the next 10 years. So we really need to focus and, and educate the public and even just if they don't want to become beekeepers, figure out what they can do as a member of the society. And eat pizza. And <laughs> eat the pizza, please. <laughs> Savoring the sweet life in Cobble Hill. From Tourism Couch, and I'm Karen Algrisma. Oh my God. I'm hungry. Yeah. Water, barley, yeast. The basic ingredients of the water of life, that is, whiskey. It's made around the world, but no two places make it the same. And Canada is increasingly being recognized on the world stage as a quality whiskey producer. At Divine Distillers, they've made an award-winning whiskey, and we're going to find out how. Join me, won't you? I've been given the official authority to present you with your silver oh, medal for your Glen Sandwich whiskey. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, it felt great to be up there with uh, you know, some of the uh, the major players, so to speak, and some of the other craft distilleries. We had about uh, 320 kilos of, uh, of milled up barley uh, and water at very specific temperatures. BC, it was kind of a little bit late getting in the game. That said, it's kind of the epicenter for micro distilling now in Canada. This is the star of uh, Divine. This is Brunhilde. This is a vintage German pot still that we restored about three years ago. <laughs> There are something like close to 50 distilleries in BC, so, you know, I say the more the merrier. We are uh, both a certified organic farm and we're also a certified craft distillery. So everything we do is from scratch, is what it comes down to. So uh, all of our grain for our whiskeys are grown right here in Saanich. If they use BC agricultural products to make their whiskey, they get a much better tax rate, and that's been very helpful. But it's also helpful to farmers in British Columbia. I wanted to do something that would really reflect Vancouver Island, so that, that was Glen Sandwich. Then we turned around and said, okay, what can we do that's completely different than anybody else is doing? And we decided to do our ancient grains whiskey, which is uh, barley, uh, uh, Khorasan, uh, Spelt, Emmer, and Einkorn. And as far as I know, nobody in North America has ever done a mash bill like that. We also decided to put it into new American oak barrels, which are very charred and kind of aggressive, we'd say, in the business. Um, so treat it more like a bourbon than a single malt. It turned out brilliantly, so we're, we're thrilled. They're really unique, robust, almost got a little bit of a nutty note to it. Just, you know, lightly peated barley and, and rye whiskey from Lowen McKinnon at Central City Brewers in Vancouver. Awesomely good whiskey. We've got wonderful whiskeys from Shelter Point. They finish in wine barrels, spectacular. BC is, is really coming along. I think they've got some really, they've got great potential, but they've also, they've kind of got a, this momentum going. The barrel is the spice rack. So that's where all your baking spices and fruit and vanilla uh, come from and kind of create this lovely fruit cake kind of layer to the whiskey. Mmm, smells like potential. We do from one to five years in barrel, uh, depending on the size. We experiment with smaller, uh, medium and larger mm. barrels. So we find that smaller casks definitely accelerate the aging process. Both tourists and locals alike have tried all the basics. They want to try something different, something interesting, which being in BC, we have a lot of craft distilleries, which is really helping that. Um, but a lot of the big distilleries are bringing out more interesting, unique releases as well. The 2017 is probably the best year ever, ever for Canadian whiskey. And it's because of, it was the, you know 150 years since our confederation as a country. Uh, all of the distillers have really, really, you know, put, put their shoulders to the wheel and with some just fabulous new whiskeys. I think Canadian whiskey is, is definitely uh, enjoying a renaissance, is how I would put it. You know, we get calls from restaurants in Las Vegas and, and Japan uh, to, send, to send whiskey, and of course we can't do it, but we're, we're thrilled to get those, those kinds of calls. A lot of these whiskeys have been sitting in the warehouses for a long, long time, like 40 years of the Canadian Club and things like that. What, I think what, what the Canadian whiskey makers are doing now is they're, they're addressing the new demand for really big, robust, flavorful whiskeys. People used to think that Canadian whiskey was, was, was light 
not light anymore. Oh, there's that's, the mixing whiskey's still there. When you taste Weiser's Legacy, that whiskey is huge. The Glen Sanders also got a 94 in the Whiskey Bible, which alongside some 12 and even 18 year old scotches. So, you know, we puts us on the map. Canadian Whiskey, the new portable expert, is an expanded version of the uh, book that I released about 2012. It talks about all of the distilleries in Canada. It's got all 41 micro distilleries that, that are making whiskey in there. Uh, I've got a map of where all the distilleries are. It really the history of Canadian whiskey, how whiskey is made, how to enjoy it, what it tastes like, and about a hundred tasting notes for, for whiskeys that are currently available. Cheers. It's a Canadian whiskey. We're playing with a, kind of a bourbon style uh, corn whiskey. Um, and we have some malted rye that I'd love to play with as well. So yeah, so we're pretty experimental here. Canadian whiskeys are enjoyed all around the world and getting the recognition that they deserve. Finally, you can enjoy some of the best right here at home. So if you're thinking whiskey, you can think local. For Community Producers, I'm Heather Leary. on my weekly trip to the Moss Street Market here in Victoria to pick up some local organic apples to make healthy candy apples. Hi David, tell me about the apples that you have here. Okay, well here we have three different varieties and we'll start with the Bramley. This is mainly a cooking apple and it's really good for pies and crumbles. And then the King Apple is kind of a cross between an eating apple and cooking apple. It's a bit more tart. And then the Gala would be a nice, sweet eating apple. Mmm, that's my favorite. So I'm making caramel apples today. Which ones would you recommend? Uh, I would recommend the Gala, because they're going to be nice and sweet. Uh, but the King would also work as well, because it would mix well with the caramel. You get more tart and the sweetness of the caramel. This is a sample of the King. So crisp, sweet, and I get that tanginess that you were talking about right. too. What's the difference between organic and conventional farming? Well, it's actually a very big difference. With organic farming, we're not allowed to use any herbicides, pesticides, uh, fungicides, nothing like that to kill all the bugs. We have to pull the weeds by hand and we just use nothing but the earth and the you know the sun to grow our, grow our produce. And we get certified every year so we come and get inspected to make sure we're following all the rules. What is the benefit of eating organic food? Well it's better for you because you don't really know when a lot of the conventional stuff you don't know what's going in your food and you know when you're spraying your crops with all these other farmers spraying your crops that goes into the soil and that grows into your food. And with organic, you don't get any of that. So it's a lot better for you. I find that organic food tastes better too. There's definitely more flavor to it. Lemon cucumbers, how cute is that? It looks like a lemon, but it's a cucumber. It kind of captures that delicate flavor of the roses. That very first taste, and then it kind of fades away. Mmm, very interesting, wow. Now I'm in the kitchen to make healthy candy apples which are great for kids of any age, even big kids like me. These are gluten-free, refined sugar-free, and dairy-free, and they're absolutely delicious and easy to make. I'm gonna start by slicing some apples into nice, thick slices. And we wanna keep the core in here. We want these to be a good half inch thick. So just like that. Now I'm going to take some sucker sticks and insert them into the bottom of each apple slice. You got to kind of wiggle it in there, just like that. I have one and a half to two cups of dark chocolate chips in my bowl here, set over a pot of hot water and it's slowly melting. I've also added two teaspoons of coconut oil to it to make it more fluid. And I'm going to be dipping my apples into this. Use your favorite dairy-free chocolate here. My chocolate is melted and ready to go. Oh, look at that. I could just eat that by the spoonful. <laughs> I have a parchment paper lined pan here that I'm gonna transfer the chocolate covered apples onto. So leave the core in, but I am gonna take the stem out. Just like that. You wanna make sure that the entire apple is covered right down to the stick to make sure that it stays in place. Give it a little shake to release excess chocolate and then place it onto the pan. 
Now I'm going to pop these into the fridge until the chocolate is nice and hard. I've got a big handful of raw almonds here that I'm going to chop up. You can use almonds, you can use peanuts, or any other nut of your choice. I also have some peanuts here. Now I'm going to make my peanut butter caramel. This is so delicious, I could eat it by the spoonful. In my bowl here, I have a quarter cup of pure maple syrup, or you could do coconut nectar or agave nectar. I'm adding a third of a cup of natural peanut butter, a quarter cup of melted coconut oil, one tablespoon of hot water, and a good pinch of Himalayan salt. I'm gonna whisk it all together. Real smooth. It is perfect. Ready to go. They've been in the fridge for about 15 minutes and the chocolate is hard. Let's check. Yep, I'm able to easily peel it off of the parchment paper. So they're ready to go. I'm gonna dip each apple halfway into the caramel. Oh, then I'm gonna sprinkle some nuts on top. You can also dip them right into the nuts if you want. And place it back onto the tray. I'll do peanuts this time. It gets a little bit messy, but don't worry, the caramel will harden up. A perfect activity to do with kids. The final step, which is totally optional, is to drizzle extra chocolate on top of the nuts and the caramel. Mmm, looking good! I'm gonna pop these back into the fridge now until the caramel firms up a bit. If you wanna expedite the process, stick them into the freezer, but not too long because you don't want the apples to freeze. The apples have been in the fridge for about 15 minutes and the caramel has firmed up. So this means I get to dig in. Look at that. How cute is that? Now the best part, I get to take a bite. You want to make sure to eat these while they are cold out of the fridge, otherwise the caramel will soften too much. Okay, I'm gonna try it. Mm, mm, mm. Crunchy, juicy, sweet, so flavorful. I hope you give these a try at home. For more great recipes, visit me at www.sweetlyraw.com.